Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this very special panel uh, celebrating 45 years of the galaxy's greatest comic. 2000 and AD. Uh, 2000 and AD. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's called, right? Uh, in this panel, we're basically, this is a panel, basically, uh, some super fans are going to discuss um, the comic and its impact both on themselves and their work and also all aspects of British culture. But wouldn't it be lovely if you guys introduced yourself and tell us maybe who your favourite 2000 AD character is? Okay, um, I'm Rowan Hooper. I'm, um, I'm currently doing the podcast for New Scientists. So uh, I do our podcast. Uh, so I'm a science journalist and a writer. Uh, before that, I was a biologist um so I, I kind of feel like I, you know and obviously started reading 2000 AD in the 80s um and my favorite character is Halo Jones there you go fantastic I am David Haunted I am a writer of all kinds of things and my favorite 2000 AD character is Zenith because I'm Ooh. down with the kids of 1993. Fantastic. And I should finish up and say, hello, I'm Sarah Morgan. I'm a comedy writer. I'm the co-author of the graphic novel Bubble. And I'm a fan of everyone here. So this is great. So it's 45 years. So do you have formative experiences? Do you remember your first time? Um, I do actually remember my first time. I found a comic in, in my nan's house in Chiswick. Um, I don't know what she was doing with it. Um, but it was it was a very early it was early 80s and um, I remember um, it had the apocalypse war in it oh no not the apocalypse the cursed earth um, so dread was crossing the cursed earth um, and that was a big you know obviously an epic famous uh, adventure and uh, but I, I just read it in the middle of it and didn't know anything about it until then I'd been reading the Beano um, and obviously very swiftly ditched the Beano and moved to 2000 AD. Interesting. How about you, Dave? Well, because I'm quite old, I was, I worked out, I was a teenager, a late teenager when 2000 AD started. So I missed it completely because in the 70s, you didn't read comics if you were a teenager, you just got <laughs> beaten up yeah. or, or listened to music. So I'd outgrown inverted commas, we used to do those in those days, I'd outgrown comics and I didn't read comics of any kind. And then it became fashionable to like things like, you know, Watchmen and The Dark Knight in the late 80s. For some reason, comics and drugs came back in the late 80s together. <laughs> they literally were smiley badges on everything, you know, children and comics and priests. And so I got into comics, which meant that I did a, instead of gravitating to graphic novels from 2000 AD, I did it the other way around. And it worked quite well because 2000 AD had obviously been a lot more graphic novelly. So I started reading it, well, just before, Grant, around about the time Grant Morrison started writing. And I was working for the NME, and I remember because I basically said I want to do a thing about 2000 AD. And they were like, why? I said, it's a comic. They were like, yeah. I said, there's a character in it called Zenith, who's a pop star superhero who fancies Kylie Minogue. And, that, <laughs> and then they said, go on then. So that's my, that really my first memory. I remember, I remember also, actually, um, Zenith used to listen to, he used to, always had headphones on and used to have, you could see what he was listening to because there'd, there'd be some lyrics. I remember that he listened to the Smiths quite a lot um, and uh, being very impressed by that. Yeah, Zenith was kind of, it was a bit unlikely that he liked the Smiths because basically he was Jason Donovan with superpowers. <laughs> um, but he was also, I think Grant Morrison, Grant Morrison was a real Glasgow indie kid at the time. So basically, I think he wanted Zenith to be more like the Soup Dragons than Jason Donovan. <laughs> but, you know, he's a superhero. He can like yeah. what he wants. Yeah. Fantastic. And Dave, you've actually been a character in, you featured in 2080. Oh, it's my proudest moment. I used to do a <laughs> column in the NME with a writer called Stephen Wells. And we really had it in for Indy, which was, I mean, basically, we were attacking the enemy's fan base in comedy every week. We, you know, we were mocking Morrissey and The Fall and all these people. And we liked Kylie Minogue, which was considered very radical amongst music journalists, but not amongst humans. And um, one of the writers- the last laugh over Morrissey, hasn't you? I know, yeah, we were right. Kylie Minogue, as yet uncancelled. You won that one. Really <laughs> um, so yeah, we would constantly bang on about how indie music was rubbish and pop was great. 
And I think we annoyed one of the writers because there was a Judge Dredd series called Marty Zbok, the Muzak Killer. He had an assistant called Indy Sado, and who looked like Robert Smith. And yeah, he basically he went round killing people who he considered to be evil. And one week there was an, a music journalist in it called David O. Stephen, who looked like Morrissey and me, only with muscles, and was going on about how great Kylie Minogue was, even though it was the year 2092 or whatever. And he was murdered with a chainsaw by Martin. <laughs> <laughs> so I've actually, so I've been half a character in 2000 AD who was murdered by presumably someone who George, oh, and also the best bit was that Stephen Wells, my writing partner, invented the word Sado. So that was kind of cool. Hang on. <laughs> he invented the word Sado in the comic or in... No, in, in the NME. We used to write quite freestyle, invented lots of things. I, was for, I first used the phrase spunk face shit given in a column that Stephen and I did, which I later reused for Veep and then... Someone said it to Donald Trump, but I digress. But yeah, he used to make up lots of phrases like sex, Kylie. And Stephen invented the word Sado. It literally occurs for the first time in one of our columns in the NME, an actual word that people say to wow. our students. Fantastic. Yeah. So, Rowan, you were more of a, you were like a childhood uh, fan. Yeah. Uh, can you remember uh, sort of, um, did you feel like it was, I mean, obviously we, we've learned that it has a terrible influence on people uh, <laughs> uh, as they grow up, but can you remember sort of um, how you felt about it as a child? Like, were you, uh, oh, sort yeah. of, would you oh, feel I, illicit? Do you feel, yeah. Um, I, it didn't, I didn't feel it being illicit, but I did feel it, um, being informative about whole worlds that I knew nothing about. Um, and I remember one of the first stories I had started reading when I just sort of picked it up was uh, a nemesis, uh, you know, an early nemesis um, story. And, and, you know, when you start at the beginning, uh, when you start at the beginning, obviously you get introduced to the characters, you learn who they are, but I sort of went in at the middle. And I remember just being so impressed by the, this world that Kevin O'Neill had, had created, uh, this the, the artistic world, and and then the the whole battle between aliens and the evil humans, uh, I just thought it was fantastic. And <laughs> but there's all there was always at first it was always like what is going on here? I had no idea, but I, I found it fascinating. Wanted to learn learn more, and then things like um, Strontium Dog as well. All the all the stuff about um, you know the mutants getting uh, getting their mutations from exposure to strontium ninety and uh, learning about elements. You know, learning about <laughs> no, I literally, you know, you learn about radiation and elements like that. And uh, I just thought, oh, that's it's all really cool and interesting. And uh, you know, I, so I found it very, very rich. It, you know, much richer than the Beano, which I'd been used to until then. So you say it's your, it was your it's your gateway into science. Yeah, I mean, science like I, I could even go that far and say that. Yeah, yeah. and certainly um, um, Alan Moore, his stuff um, stayed with me a long, long time. And, um, you know, um, so it's not in 2000 AD, but Swamp Thing um, also had a really big influence on me. And I, you know, I, I met Alan Moore once. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And I, I we had a really great old discussion about about how literally things that I'd read of his um, when I was a kid you know, they stay with you a long time. And that's, that is something that I think many people will say about 2000 AD, the stories in that, that they, they, it really stays with you and it, and it can form, be formative. Yeah. Do you think um, it was sort of predicted uh, anything in, in science, uh, in terms of like hard science? <sighs> um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not, because it's still all, you know, like time travel and, you know, mm. stuff like that. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, the other thing I remember, there's a lot of neuroscience in it, in, especially in, with Judge Anderson. I really remember um, when she first came on the scene and um, she's in PSI division and, uh, you know, you go, what's that? And it's like a psionics. It's like this mind reading division of the judges. And I remember thinking maybe psionics is a real thing. And I went to, I talked about it at school. I remember one of my teachers saying, I don't think psionics is a real <laughs> is a real thing mm. but but obviously neuroscience um uh you know they they borrow ideas don't they from 
the the edges of of neuroscience and of physics and and then and run with them that's that's what you do i mean i'll ask this to both of you is there anything that you saw uh, sort of predicted or uh, invented in 2080 that you thought would be great it to have in real life or in any sci-fi yeah i mean i think in um rogue trooper i just love the idea that basically it was an old fashioned story about three dudes just getting their revenge on the man but two of them had been downloaded into chip form <laughs> and you know they were in and so one of them was called it was a great coincidence that the one who was in road troopers helmet was called helm yeah and i, I always thought that was in his, yeah one of them gunner was in his life, it was, was gunner and bagman and helm and a bagman yeah and it was just <laughs> I bet when they, I bet when they got, when Bagman got put in the bag, he was like, "Oh come on, this is just nominative determinism." And it's for, but the idea that, I mean, I, I'd heard about obviously you know downloaded stuff and all that or mm. whatever it was called. There. But the idea that you could go around, be downloaded into a gun or whatever, and still hang out the consciousness thing that you know William Gibson and Ian Bank, loads of people, the fact that your consciousness could continue in digital or whatever form was really exciting to me. And also in the form of a buddy of a buddy movie story too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's another thing. I really clearly remember the first time they showed that in Rogue Trooper when um, there must have been a flashback or something when one of them had died and he took the chip out of his and it said like, "But death is not the end." And it took the chip out, and that and you realise that 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 the consciousness had been uploaded onto the chip, and that was that was so really cool stuff. It was an exciting moment. <laughs> But I mean, and also just because Alan Moore, you know, the future shocks, which was basically a real deliberate throwback to sort of 1950s horror comics and stuff like that. But they were all, loads of them were idea based. And I wanted to show one to my son, which is the one where the bloke invents time travel by looking into the fire and the shape of one of the flames gives him an idea for a scientific thing. And then his future self appears and says, don't do that. And <laughs> other, another future self appears and says, don't listen to him. And it goes on for it. You know, just that was that's the parallel universe theory, quantum physics in one I expect. I don't know science much. But you know, it was the fact it was a comic of ideas. I mean, yeah, we've met, you've mentioned the Beano, I've got nothing against the Beano, but you never sit there reading Dennis and the Menace going, Oh my god. Yeah. So even though it was rough, tough men bonding with an awful lot of lone men in helmets getting revenge <laughs> on someone, um, it was also it was a it was a comic of ideas. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. Have the, have the heroes changed much in, well, I, I'll say not the last 45 years of the comic, but in, in, in the time you've been reading it, have they, are they still just angry men in hats going <laughs> and getting things? Or... Not just hats. Not like, I think there is one Special the hats. <laughs> um, I mean, that is a key element that you mustn't mm. mess with, isn't it? Um but I think uh, I'll, I'll mention Halo Jones again here because, mm. you know, she did come in and, and really it was, you know, there were there were no there was no one like that really at, at the time that, you know, uh, just a, a young woman with no special powers, no rifle, or, you know, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing at all. And just completely ordinary woman um, and became the, the hero of this epic story. Um, so and I found that like novelistic in t in the sense of it you know, there, there was so much character there um that it i f i felt that that did something that the the other stories as much as i'd loved them didn't didn't i didn't sink into them as much as i did with with halo jones um for me i mean a halo jones was a role model yeah which was great because there's just a line she said you know somebody asked her she said something like I wanted to go everywhere, do everything, and see everything. And that was quite punk rock, just that idea. That it's like, why not? You know, yeah, if I'm going to just... be a writer for a career, why not? Yeah. But in recent years, 2000 AD, I don't read it a lot now because I'm 90, but it's <laughs> it has moved away from the stereotype. You know, there's a wider, there's more diversity in the writing, in the stories, and in the characters. I mean, when I was reading it, yeah, there was Halo Jones, but Halo Jones was the only female character who didn't have a huge bust. At times, you know, <laughs> 2000 AD was like Marvel. Everyone seemed to be sponsored by a bra manufacturer. <laughs> and there was a lot of, it wasn't, you know, as bad as heavy metal album covers. You know, there were female characters with agency. But, you know, you could only have that agency if you had a Marilyn Monroe figure. Yeah. That, I think, has changed. I think... You, yeah, it has. 
in not the kind of boring thing if you wouldn't get away with it. They're just not interested in that sort of thing. No, no. Although, yeah, I mean, teenage boys reading it, you know, they that's that's why they were there in the in the mid eighties, isn't it? Yeah, I remember Absolutely. Judge Judge Anderson was always dressed like, <laughs> yeah, dressed very provocatively. Let's say compared to the other judges. Yeah, she had. I mean, they all had a zip jumpsuit, but her zip was a bit dangly. Yeah, sprayed <laughs> on the uniform, dummy. sort of sprayed on uniform. You know? Whereas you think Stallone, you know, Judge Dredd had the biggest knockers going, but he managed to find a top that fitted. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it has <laughs> changed. But sorry, sir. No, no, I was going to say because you mentioned talk about reading it with your kids, and obviously there's a sense of excitement like you're passing it on. Is, is there a sense of sort of excitement of passing on something that you, well, you, you didn't enjoy as a teenager, but you feel like you would have enjoyed as a teenager? Yeah, I mean, they're a bit old to actually read most of it. Um, and it is, I think it is more violent and sweary than it was now, which was a bit of a surprise. So I think the age range has moved up. But yeah, I hope that in later years they will enjoy lonely men with helmets <laughs> revenge. I feel like you're pretty pitching for this new... <laughs> Only helmet, man. When we think about Heather Jones, she didn't have a helmet, so she did stand out. But yeah, we should move away from helmets. So to speak, her. yeah. Uh, <laughs> as far as we know. Um, I mean, that's Dave, have you ever, uh, as a writer, sort of pitched a story to them? Is there something you would like to write for them? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm actually really glad because I did pitch a... Um, I forget, a one-off. I think it was a future shock. And I worked on it quite hard with the with the then editor. Oh, after a while, then turned around and quite rightly said, this is quite old fashioned because I was trying to write a 1980s style story. Mm. Um, but I kept the idea and turned it into a novel. Ricky's Hand, yeah. which is out this summer through Titan Books. Um, oh, seamless. But yeah, I really, well, I was aware and I think he was, I was being a bit of a, you know, oh, I think I'll do a bit of comic writing. What fun. And I've done bits of, of comic writing here and there, but you know, I could understand people just thinking that I turned up to have a go and show <laughs> how it was done. But it's interesting. I mean, Ryan, do you have favourite writers on uh, in the comic that you would you would read anything by them and follow them out through the through two thousand eighty onto their later works? Um, definitely, it, obviously, Alan Moore um, is is the standout one for me. Mm. Um, uh, but but these days, uh, Rob Williams, I, I really love his stuff, um, and and, and the, there is you can tell he's um, very immersed in the history. You know, these lovely throwbacks to a lot of stuff from the past when he writes dread stories. And actually, I I've never um, pitched a story to 2000 AD, um, but I did say to Rob once that what I'd like to see in in Judge Dread is so <laughs> there's you get different kinds of judges, right? There's the the SJS that investigate other judges. And then there's like the Wally squad, which are the uh, undercover judges. But um, you don't get a kind of detective, like a regular detective. Like we we would have a uniformed police officer in our, in our world. We have uniformed police and we have detectives. Um, it'd be nice to see a, a kind of detective um, version of a judge. And, um, you know, I think you could create a, a nice character that would still be um, in the justice department, but be uh, this n a new branch of of officer, and there might be something fun to do there. But, oh, that's but, cool! <laughs> I agree. So I've just for absolutely no reason, probably just to mention it. I love the names of judges. That sometimes there would be a point to it, and I still remember one episode. There was a judge called Purcell for no other reason other than the person Judge <laughs> Purcell made a suggestion and Judge Red said that won't wash Purcell yeah, yeah. oh come on <laughs> what? yeah and the and the the names of the blocks in um, Mega City yeah. One you know they're always there's always fantastic like Brad Pitt block or something and they're and especially during Block Mania when they're fighting there's classic scenes with different blocks uh, turning up on each other but yeah they, was, they often I, have little jokes with the names of those I mean that's the thing that's like we keep mentioning the Beena, but, you know, it's funny in a way that DC and Marvel are not funny. Yeah. You know, I... Marvel's idea of funny is Spider-Man going, whoops, friendly neighbour, in a kind of irritating arch fashion. <laughs> yeah. Um, Batman used, but, yeah, it's 
Judge Dredd, you know, he's a Clint Eastwood style Robocop psychopath, but it's a really funny comic. And it just ties into sort of British traditions of horror, British comedy, comic traditions, all that kind of stuff. You know, you it, daft psychopaths. I love it. Yeah. Is it? Oh, sorry. No, no, I was just going to agree. You know, there there is a, a humour in it um, that you don't get in with with uh, Marvel. And that's why I've just always preferred. I've always been much more um, into 2000 AD and all the characters and strips than, in that than I have. I've never quite got as much in. It just doesn't do it for me as much with, with uh, the US stuff, as good as that can be as well. It's, it's interesting that they, they've attempted a Hollywood transfer and... I don't know. I mean, is the jury still out on that one? But um, what of dread? Yeah. Uh, oh I, no, I think it, that that really worked, didn't it? I mean, that was Alex Garland who wrote it, so he knew it was the Carl Urban one. Yeah, I mean, he yeah, that's it, right. that, that was brilliant because um, it was it was scripted by by a Brit, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was brilliantly written, and, um, and so it wasn't it wasn't an Americanized version, so to speak. You know, it wasn't a sort of DC version. It it mm. it, made, it carried over all the stuff that we love that from the actual judge dread strip so it worked i thought that worked really well and also okay. so, as you will know sarah it was the whole thing about the hero's journey that people used to say about judge dread being filmed it could never be filmed because in the film the character has to grow and change hmm. and learn and <laughs> judge dread that never happens judge dread starts off evil people are bad good is good people can't be trusted you have to and he never changes. And what was nice about the Judge Red movie with Carl Urban was that's what happened. He never changed. He never embraced hmm. anything. I think he smiled a bit once. And that was like, whoa. Yeah. I mean, it feels like the, the, the sort of British comic sensibility, um, and I'm someone who grew up on Tank Girl and Deadline and, and that kind of sense of humour, has, has finally started making the transfer over to very serious, maybe not in the films, but certainly in the TV I and mean, things like The Boys and Peacemaker and shows like that in the US feel like they're, they understand what jokes are now. Yeah. And actually <laughs> um, the Mandalorian um, yeah. ha has, does owe something to Dredd as well, I think. And, you know, he never takes his helmet off the Mandalorian mm. like Dredd. Um, I don't know whether that's just coincidence that it's, that it's that similarity. Um, and there is a, you know, I won't say it's, it's, it's not comedy, <laughs> the Mandalorian, but uh, there is more, there is, they have a bit of fun with it than than you might expect in a, a sort of typical Star Wars um, universe type of production. Yeah, they seem to understand now in Hollywood that a joke isn't just Hulk smash, <laughs> <laughs> and that will do you for two and a half hours of yeah, no jokes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think also because something like The Boys is more because there's more horror in it. You know, that's the Mark Miller thing, particularly. And comedy and horror always go well because it's so mm. disgusting. You know, the boys basically is just, so when's the head going to explode this week? Every yeah, week. It's about know, timing head. as well. It's about, it's, yeah. it's the same same kind of timing, isn't it? A, 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 to a good, a good joke or a good horrific moment. I mean, I've seen Absolutely. the first few episodes of Peacemaker, which is the spin-off from Suicide Squad. And that is, yeah, it's, it's timed like a, like a comedy. I haven't seen Peacemaker on telly, but the, yeah, the, the new Suicide Squad movie mm. was very funny, very enjoyable, and got the balance right, whereas the first one just seemed to be like, I don't know, disgusting. That's a word. <laughs> it was disgusting. Um, have you seen any other sort of, uh, you know, expanding expanding the, the you know, not just 2080, but expanding that kind of British comic sensibility? Um, any uh, Any other sort of crossovers that you feel are, you know are we are we slowly culturally leaking out into the rest of the world mm. it's an interesting one um because i was about going to say thinking earlier that what happened to the 2080 writers when they did go to america in comics mm. first and grant morrison took his sensibility to invisibles and animal man alan moore and alan moore did watchman which isn't has humor in it but isn't very funny and when you watch the brilliant Watchmen, I was going to say remake, whatever it is, it's got that kind of slightly quirky humour yeah. as mm. well. And you see that humour in other areas. I mean, just, oh, God. The Leftovers, that's the one. 
It was made by the bloke who made Watchmen, so I went back and watched it. And that was brilliant. That was queasy and frightening because it was people missing. But it was all, and the first series was relentlessly grim. The second series was funny as well. So, and had Doctor Who in it. So, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that's, I think that the British thing is taking the piss because the British, you know, the British probably invented the joke about Superman where if he's so smart, why does he wear his underpants over his trousers? Yeah. That attitude, when British people do Superman the, and Batman, the two most humorless characters in the history of comics, apart from the 50s, um, they do something funny with it, perhaps because British writers grew up with 60s Batman. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I wonder if they're more uh, coming from a, like the British sense of humour is to interrogate the rules of something. So if you mm-hmm. say, you know, this is how Superman works, the funniest thing to do is drill down and go, well, how would that work? How would that work? Which again feels quite sciencey to bring it back around to uh, to sci-fi. Um, do you do you think that the the, the sort of sci-fi um, community, sorry, the science community, Rowan, have um, are, are generally sort of comics fans, superhero fans? Um, not generally, I don't think. No, I think it's probably probably the same proportion as in the rest of the any other part of the population um so no it's not something yet you're an outlier <laughs> yeah it's not i don't really you know there's not many people i would chat to about 2000 ad at work um but oh. there, are, there are a few there are a few and actually when um i remember when um i had the interview with alan moore and um i was so excited you know I jumped up and down in the office going oh, i've got in and then lots of people were like whoa that's amazing mm. and like you know it's not you don't normally get that reaction when you you, you book an interview with any old person that we do that, that we go and meet so um so yeah i mean he's he's really broken through that's fantastic so i've got a question i've got some i've got some uh, fan questions here <laughs> David, uh, oh no, you got that one. Uh, so it feels like comic and music, f- comics and music, fed off each other in the nineteen eighties. Yeah, really did. Um, I think because you know suddenly it was acceptable to say that you read comics, and obviously mm. music- musicians don't do anything, you know. So they read a lot of comics. Suddenly, all the influence of comics was in things. It was also the rise of of, mo- of you know the return of superhero movies. So you had Prince doing Batman, but pop, I mean, yeah, Pop will eat itself, weirdly, who I named and who I named because of a moment in Swamp Thing, bizarrely enough. Oh, was interesting. Creature. Sorry, yeah, sorry, no, creature. please tell that story again, yeah. like we all know it. Yeah, I'll just, <laughs> so I'll you just named tell. the band Pop will eat itself. I'm sorry, this is from the greatest hits of anecdotes, Dave, but we want to hear it again. Okay, this is, I love telling this one because I was reading Swamp Thing and in it there was a mythological creature called the Ouroboros. I pronounced it wrong, but it was a snake that renews itself and eats itself. It's literally swallowing its own tail and just presumably pooing its face off or something, I don't know. But I was really taken by the idea of something eating itself. So I wrote an NME article about sampling and that sort of thing and how bands would sample themselves and sample and sample. And I said, and in the end, pop will eat itself. Mm. And then a band named themselves after it and started using sampling. And that went round and round. And they mentioned Alan Moore in a song which was itself, so culture eating itself. But yeah, all those bands were massively into comics and skate fashion, and everybody was acting like Bart Simpson, basically, another <laughs> reference of the era. And it was absolutely... Am- and then when you mentioned Tank Girl and Deadline and Crisis and all those comics, they were aimed at a teen audience, and a teen audience was mad for them. And it was all tied together, you know, and you end up with gorillas. Yeah. So that's what we, so yeah. <laughs> so you end up with gorillas. No, yeah, that's yeah, what happy. you end up with. That's what, yeah. <laughs> but yes, it's massive, massive crossover and influence. That's really interesting. The idea that culture uh, in the eighties felt like uh, it was the end of culture. We were going to implode with being postmodern and ironic, and we've sort of shuffled. <laughs> shuffled along for another you know 40 odd years pop we've been made a few itself. we've made a few yeah pop did not eat itself but that's fantastic that you named a band those were the days <laughs> well uh without what do so you still both read uh 2080 now do you pick it up uh, there's no wrong answer okay occas- no occasionally i do but i tend to actually wait for the collections to come along and then Lovely. and then get those 
Um, so when I, you know, when there's a, you know, a big dread collection that's uh, that's that's coming out, then I, I tend to do it like that. I don't. I did read it. I pick it up every so often, every few years, in the way that I might listen to a Bruce Springsteen record, which is no slight on 2000 AD, but just to sort of keep in touch. Mostly if I buy a comic, it's because I've seen it on telly now. How so? Do you mean you've seen it on Like the boys. I might read Oh, okay. So so you'll you'll reverse engineer your... uh... And also because I have small children, most of the time, if I buy a comic, it's generally because it's got an octonaut on stuck to the front of it <laughs> they've kind of grown out of that now yeah i mean there's a sad thing about comics now that they are basically backing for toys you know you literally you'll buy a princess doll with a comic stuck to its bum or a ray gun with a comic stuck to its back <laughs> there's i think i think the Bino. I don't know. I think it's a front for a drug laundering operation. I can't believe that <laughs> kids hop off their bikes and say, a Beano, please, in the news agent. No, it's weird. My kid actually loves the Beano. She uh, she loves the Beano in a way that I loved the Beano. Like, you know, you'd get your googly-eyed Nasher badge by sending off five stamps. And I think, yeah. And, and she makes me email into the competitions and I feel weird doing it. Like I should have, uh, oh, that's my headphones dying. Um <laughs> Yeah, I feel, it feels weird emailing into the competitions because they should be, you know, some milk bottle tops stuck to an envelope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I did some work for Dennis and Asher on telly and they sent us some lovely, like, Beano membership stuff and my wife stole it because she'd actually been a member of the Dennis fan club. So I don't have the Nasher googly eye badge because <laughs> my wife has stolen it. Quite angry, actually. Are you? Well, you can, yeah. you can all get your own. Just apply to join. <laughs> oh no, I'll be one of those awful people in the local paper. 60 year old Beano fan. I remember Ego. <laughs> With your Blue Peter well, bag. Ego, Ego was an Austrian. I mean, I hate. Oh, retro culture, reference culture. There's probably a Dennis, Dennis the Menace episode with Ego the fucking ostrich in it. <laughs> You don't think on a panel about remembering the glory years of 2008 in the 80s might be a, a safe space for retro nostalgia? I did write for On The Hour, a fake advert, and it was so funny in 1989. It was like Dennis the Menace, the graphic novel. And I really thought that was the height of irony, you know, a tough mm. modern Judge Dennis. I didn't realise now they've probably done it. Yeah, the sexy gritty rebootification of everything. I mean, that's an interesting one. I mean, if there's a, if there's any character that uh, from 2000 AD that they've tried to, that you think they should try and do now, that you think would fit in with the gritty dark uh, TV universe that we live in at the moment. It's all those. I, I'm coming back to it again. Lonely men with helmets. It was all <laughs> a lot of everything was gritty. You know, even like Slane, who was a Celtic warrior who lived in a cauldron or something. It was pretty gritty because it was descended from those weird 70s boys comics called Cut My Head Off, you know, or <laughs> Murderer's School or SS Nazi Death Camp Kid. <laughs> you know, that really weird phase when comics were incredibly violent and horrific. So Judge Dredd's always been gritty. It's the exceptions are the stories that aren't gritty, I think. There was one about an alien who was ripped off from E.T. I think Alan Moore did. That wasn't gritty. But it was said Northampton. <laughs> Do you think it's those sort of peculiarly British details that that make us feel uh, nostalgic for and, and and warm and comforted by uh, by stuff like this? Yeah, I mean Rowan mentioned you know the block names um, in to, in Judge Dredd, and I think it's those British references that you know you might be reading Judge Dredd, but Morecambe and Wise might turn up for example, yeah. and probably have. There probably has been a Judge Morecambe and a Judge Wise, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, fantastic. Um, so, Rowan, we sort of touched on this already, but um, I, I, the, how, how, how do you think um, 2080 and, and sci-fi generally has, has predicted how things are now? Mm. In, in this beautiful this, um, utopian well you know I, I often think how it it megacity one um you know 
it, it doesn't have climate change in it. it. They're not living in a climate changed world at all. They're living in a post apocalyptic world, and and actually, so they, they got that wrong in a sense. But um, I just actually found it really chilling last week when I saw that it was forty years ago that the that two thousand AD was running the apocalypse war, um, and yeah. dread was in East Meg One. Uh, to, it was basically in Russia trying to, to kill all the Sovs, the Sovs. And, um, Sovs. Yeah, they yeah, your Sovs come over, get your heads in. And, um, <laughs> you know, I remember that, I, I really remember all this, you know, because, um, uh, you know, the, the East Meg judges had the really cool uniforms, actually. They were, they were awesome uh, versions of the judges. Um, but then, yeah, oh, my God. Uh, in Afghanistan, sorry to interrupt. But But, like... Forty years ago, they there were there was a story in the comic about nuclear, literally nuclear war between uh, America, you know, the West and the East, and and where are we now? You know, so that was a that was chilling. But what? So, but back to the point was, was that what they didn't really get. What I often think is, um, yeah, the the they didn't the the future America that the world set in 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 Judge Dredd is. Uh, is a post-apocalyptic one rather than a, a post-climate change one. So I can't really blame them for that because no one was really talking about climate change much in the 80s. But uh, that, that, that's something that's just not hap- that's not there. I mean, that's something they, they should tackle now, I think. Yes, that would be interesting. I mean, this the sepia desert wasteland of, of a, a utopian future is, um, yeah, whether that's climate change or a, a dystopian, sorry, uh, future, whether, whether that's climate change or a, uh, some kind of uh, unnameable apocalypse. Oh, it's really, mm. it's really joyous. I um, I picked up the the Usborne book of the future the other day. Um, just to, I like to check in with it and see what they predict. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, uh, I was. They they were very into spoon bending in the seventies. They're very into <laughs> Yuri Geller and spoon bending, and thought we would all be psychic in the future. Um, and it was it was it was it was excited about when all the futuristic spoon benders would have us have us all reading each other's minds. And it's a shame that 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 sort of fizzled away. Unless you can tell me different, Rowan, is that I don't. I don't think really it like was a shame. Wrong. No, no, it was. Nothing a, it's more very... boring. Than... Than fraudulent spoon benders. If it had been real, I don't know why spoon bending would have helped us in the future, but it, it seemed like they were really into it at Osborne anyway. Yeah. I think what Judge Red did do was because of the relentless grimness, it did predict the kind of you've got everything, but you've got nothing, the kind of surveillance culture, the fact that it is just mass entertainment. You know, they was really good on gormless TV hosts, mm. meaningless entertainment shows. So, you know, that kind of weird thing when, you know, you've got a massive celebrity. It didn't quite have Twitter, but it had this massive world where everyone is watching garish, exciting entertainment in their tiny little horrible room. Hmm. You know, everyone's sort of eating crappy mulch and going, life is great. And, then <laughs> so often, and, you know, you could do an extended metaphor and say that the blocks are a bit like the little echo chambers of Twitter and Facebook. If you wanted to go that far, I'm sure... I mean, I kind of feel sometimes that I'm living in one of those places where I have to watch another fucking programme with the great British in the title <laughs> while waiting for my Deliveroo. Yeah. It's like fascism, actually, if you think about it. Watching television and eating pizza. It's exactly like fascism, yeah. yeah or like Wally, if you prefer. It's exactly. It's what <laughs> the little draws. pod where they feed you and, and give you telly and you change uh, your fashions every five minutes. I mean, is there a particular dystopian future that you'd like to live in more than another <laughs> one? <laughs> I put this to the panel. Oh. Well, you know what? Um, in in many ways, so this is this is going to be really really bleak <laughs> answer. But uh, <laughs> actually, conversation about now. So. <laughs> but actually, uh, you know, in some ways, I'd take any of the so-called dystopian mm. futures in two thousand AD over what we might actually get. You know, there's there's dystopian that you get in in um, you know in popular culture, and then there's really really horrendous like the end of humanity and eking out of existence and 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 you know total destruction. Uh, so you know which which you you know there's the there's that um, Cormac McCarthy novel the the road, um, and that's probably the only one that's gone 
that far to have um, and I'm not talking about the movie version, which is like gives hope at the end. <laughs> you know, in, in the book, it's all it's all about net. Nah, uh, this is uh, this is all bad. Uh, you know, there's some unnamed environmental disaster. Everything's it's all over basically, and uh, th- we're just we'll just l- look at a, one small story about the the end of the world here. Uh, so, you know. Uh, what was I? What was it? Yeah, basically, I, <laughs> what, uh, which your question was? Which dystopia well, would I most? What's your favourite like? dystopia? Was really the question. But I, I just, I think we can all just sit and enjoy the the sort of silence that we've. Just, <laughs> even though the yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll never get invited back. Science than I do has just told me where. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't certainly don't want to say that that's where we're going at all. Hmm. But you know, uh, if you wanted to be incredibly bleak, uh, but which which I'm not. Um, you know, I definitely always got to emphasize the 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 optimistic route and the hope and the, what we can do to avoid this. Um, but if you were a writer who wanted to to go somewhere dark with that had some kind of basis to it, then uh, you you could. I mean, um, yeah, there's uh, yeah. Look at look at Halo Jones. So that's the that's in the fiftieth century. You know, she's living in a uh, in a world not too dissimilar to um, to the world of Judge Dredd. It's just a sort of very modernised robots everywhere. But then you've got um, the world of Nemesis the Warlock, and uh, and that's Earth overrun by t- totally overrun by by fascists, um, and the and the aliens are fighting back. But but you know, it's pretty bleak for the aliens mostly. So. But, but yeah, but that, there's a yeah. What's her name? Purity Brown is the one of the humans who fights on the side of the aliens in Nemesis. So perhaps I'd be, uh, you know, I'd, I'd go and join that <laughs> that dystopian world. I would live in the bed sitting room by Spike Milligan, John Antrobus, <laughs> because even though it's in a post apocalyptic world where people are turning into bed sitting rooms and wardrobes. And you've got like uh, Frank Thornton going around doing all the television by kneeling behind a broken television set and talking through the screen. You'd be living in a world of great British comedians, everyone from Arthur Lowe to Dudley Moore and Peter Cook, and it would be quite entertaining. And it has my favourite moment in a post-apocalyptic comedy when they're standing in a nuclear wasteland and one of the older people says to two teenagers, you young people go off and dance. And the two young actors go off and just start jiving on a rubbish heap to no music whatsoever. So I think that I would live in that (laughs) post-apocalyptic future. Fantastic. Um, uh, And what what, what sort of stories do you think, and now uh, you say 2000 AD is something you sort of dip into now uh, rather than... um, what sort of stories do you think they could be doing now that are, are uh, that are, that are different to what you grew up on? Gosh, that's a good question. Mm. Um, I think just in the the post information, post digital split world, I love all that kind of thing. Fake news, false stories, all that. Just the sort of the centre cannot hold thing. Because the whole world of 2000 AD, like a lot of old science fiction, assumes a centre. It assumes that there's some kind of galactic base or that Mega City One is the place. It didn't predict the complete fragmentation of everything where we are all sat in rooms doing this and going, apparently, Domino's Pizza contains biological weapons invented (laughs) by Lucille Ball or whatever. Um, And... I don't know how you do that as a story, but it would be fun. I think you'd just go back to Zenith fighting horrible multidimensional creatures that were trying to take over the universe by sowing doubt and ripping people in half. That's what I'd write. Fantastic. <laughs> you should start pitching it. <laughs> well, really I'd like to that. I'd like to see um uh, a story with robots in it where robots um are not the enemy um and actually um, maybe you could flip it and have uh, have robots are the savior of humanity, 
um, which I think might be more likely than, and at least it's it's a different take on the old Terminator mm. story. You know, the robots are going to rise up and kill us all, which you know, no, they're not. But they're, they're probably going to help oh, us. No, they're not. No, this is interesting. <laughs> well, I don't think they are. No. I think I think um, artificial intelligence. Um, well, you know, the way people love to talk about it in fiction and science fiction is that it um it becomes self-aware uh, and then it it goes all right let's just wipe out humanity but but that's probably unlikely uh, i'd like to see a story where that doesn't happen and and actually it gets us out of the mess that we're in because it's it is more intelligent than us so it might be nice to to turn it around and have um uh super intelligent robots or or um artificial intelligence of some other kind that um, is actually on our side or does better than than us just to just to change it around that's interesting that's a good angle it's the, the first the first thought with robot stuff is it's going to be and how how can how are they evil how are they going to ruin our lives <laughs> yeah it'd be great if the, um, the sex robot gone wrong actually just thinks they're too good for the person they're in a relationship with. right right <laughs> yeah. it's just totally human guilt you know the moment we invent robots, the, you know, first of all, we invent robots, the idea of it. The second thing we go, I bet they kill us. I wouldn't be surprised. We deserve it, really. Yeah. Sex robots, especially, you know, like, oh, look, I've built a robot for having sex with. Ugh, I imagine it's going to kill me. I wouldn't blame it either. Yeah. Well, the the, the, the whole word, the word robot comes from the, the word slave, right? The Czech word for slave. So um, it's right there embedded in the in the vocabulary of, of, of it. Um so you know, but to to turn it to turn it around and think, well, let's 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 work with them, and what can we learn from them, you know, uh, and to give them autonomy. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking of the of the of the book by this uh, of the same name by Annalee Newitz. Um, it's a great book about um, basically enslaved robots in the future who who work to gain their own autonomy away from humans. And uh, it's really, it's really to think, thinking about robots compassionately like that. It's re really interesting. I like the sound of it. Yeah, it's really, it's worth, worth checking out. Fantastic. Um, I guess, and finally, in terms of sort of your, uh, both of your 2080 uh, super fandom, uh, <laughs> how do you think um, that, that sort of younger days um, fandom of this sort of fed into your um, uh, into, into your work now, the work that you're doing now. I, I think for me, it was, sorry, I sorry. think for me it was imagination and humour. Really, that combination that I never grew up, and also intelligence. I never grew up thinking that science fiction was beneath me, or that it was something childish. Even when I stopped reading comics, I carried on with science fiction. And I think it's the humour in it, the fact that you can combine the two. I've always hated books or films or anything with no humour in because it's unrealistic, mm. because there's humour in everything. You know, even in death, especially in death, there is humour. And especially now that science takes a larger part in our lives, it's important to keep the human element in science and the human aspect. Yeah, there's kind of an optimism in 2000 AD because it does say, yes, it's going to be a horrific nuclear war. 99% of the human race are going to be killed, but we're still going to be idiots living in giant blocks and doing absurd things to each other. And we're still going to have baking shows. And that, I think, is the lesson that we can all take from this. We're still going to have baking shows. Ah, you've got it in for the Bake Off, haven't you? Oh, all those shows. It's like you can bake. Wow, great. Where's my cake? That's that's I mean, they, they do always sort of seem to hold up a lot of really nice looking ingredients, put them in a bowl together and mix them up. And I'm sure it tastes fine. <laughs> like it's quite, quite hard to think how that's going to go wrong in any severe way. Just a load of nice ingredients in a bowl. <laughs> also the idea of watching food. You can't taste it. I mean, I understand the repair shop, you know, it's like, have you got something that belonged to your granddad? Yes, I have. We fixed it. I feel sad because it looks like how I remember it. Thank you. Emotion. Kate, here's, here's some film of a cake. Yes, that certainly looks like a cake. Well done, everybody <laughs> who's made a cake. <laughs> so, Rowan, uh, same question to you. Like, how is, how is uh, the sort of uh, voice and tone and, and growing up as a 2080 kid influenced your, the work you do now? Mm. Um, I guess it's just the, the, 
the richness of 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 sources of things that you get from that you find in 2000 AD. You know, the writers um, they bring stuff in from all over the place. And as a kid, like I said at the beginning, you know, I loved that you find out things you've never you've never heard of before. There's there's all sorts of there's history in it. You know, we talked about slain. And, um, you know, that, that might lead someone on to learn about, you know, paganism or, or Celtic history, um, that, which you just might not have come across before. Or the same with, with something about robots or with Strontium-90 or uh, anything like that. Um, and so I think just generally, I like to have to try to bring a richness of, of stuff into, into anything I do as well. So it's a, there's this kind of influence like that. Um, I mean, it, my last book, I did actually quote Halo Jones in it because I had a chapter um, about how we need to revolutionise our entire system of global agriculture. Um, and the, it, it just reminded me of a bit in Halo Jones where she's on some exoplanet and they're frying some eggs and she's never seen eggs before. But, and she's like, what is, what is that? And the the woman frying the eggs say, oh, there's just some fried eggs. And she, she goes, what eggs, what, like from an animal's ovary. <laughs> oh my God, that's disgusting. And, um, and the point there is that, well, the point I was trying to make is that not that we have to find that disgusting, but that eventually I think our future will be one where um, we, we certainly don't consume animal products in anything mm. like the, the amount we do now. And so that's why I managed to wedge in a quote from Halo Jones into the Yeah. I mean, question eggs seems to be a fantastic uh, <laughs> you know, point of view, <laughs> getting your readership to question everything and, and, and approach things with a curiosity, including eggs. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Um, well, we, I guess we can wrap things up here. Um, does anyone have anything they'd like to, what are they working? What are you working on at the moment, Ryan? Um, uh, p- apart from the podcast, a couple of, of new book ideas, um, which I'm kicking around to decide which one to do first. Okay. Yeah. But they can find the, uh, what's the podcast called and where can they find it? Where can new our, our new scientist. Yeah. It's new scientist weekly. Find it everywhere. <laughs> find all the, find all the usual sure. places. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Dave. Yeah. Well, I've got a film out called book of love at the moment. I've got a radio series with French and Saunders and my science fiction book, inspired by being turned by, by 2000 AD, <laughs> it's called Ricky's Hand. It's about a man who wakes up one day with someone else's hand on his wrist and takes it from there. So it's pure science fiction. Fantastic. A story that didn't make it into 2000 AD, but has made it into novel form into decades novel later. Form what are That's you up to at the moment, Sarah? Plug something. Oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, by Bobble, it's a fun graphic novel that's uh, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> Bobble, what, a, what a lovely panel this has been um, there's lots of other uh, panels that you can uh, check in this fantastic weekend celebrating 2000 AD um, so thank you so much for tuning in and um, bye <laughs> Hi, thank you very bye. much bye. Thanks. Bye. hooray for 2000 AD hooray, hooray for 2000 AD bye